Welcome to Move Church. Thanks for joining us for this week's message. We pray this message will both move and inspire you to make a decision into an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship is where you obtain freedom and will help value your purpose and give you the power to engage your world. Now to the message. How you feeling? Come on, I got some of y'all. Can y'all get a little louder for me really quickly? I need to hear you. Come on, let's make some noise for Jesus. Come on, let's make noise for the King. Let's worship Him. Come on, let's worship Him right now all over this place. Hallelujah. How y'all doing? Hey, um, it's Sunday, and uh, we're back. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, every time uh, I get this opportunity, I just get goosebumps. God is just good, amen? amen. I just get so many reminders uh, in every moment of my life um, of all of just the goodness of God. And so today's no different. Um, I'm just really looking forward because I got a word for you. Turn to your neighbor, say, he, he's got a word for you. I ain't playing, y'all. I'm not playing. I'm not playing with you. Listen, uh, I wrote this series a little while back, and uh, I'm really excited about this moment because I think it's the perfect time for us to incorporate a conversation to this magnitude um, because, hey, you know what? I talk a lot for a living. I don't care what y'all think about that. Um, there's a theme that I've been noticing that's been consistent in the conversations that I've been having. And today's message title, I think, probably insinuates some of what's happening uh, in the hearts of even people who come to church. There's a lack of hope in our world. I'm gonna say that one more. There's a lack of hope in our world. It's not that there's not hope, but there's a lack of hope in our world. The title of today's message is Risky Business. You got to get this. When you make a decision to live for Jesus, there's no safety involved in the decision anymore. Now, I got to explain that to you because you're probably thinking he's not going to protect me. He will but he wants you to make a decision which incorporates your faith. We talk about it a lot, we live it less. That's just the reality. Most of us could probably, we'd probably attest that our faith is attached to our wallet. Maybe our faith is attached to the works we've been able to produce in our world. And so when I talk about people not having hope, it's because they don't have examples of what hope looks like in their every single day life. And sometimes you put your hope in the wrong things, which are hopeless, and that leads you to not have any hope. What am I talking about? The job that you have does not supply hope for you. At best, it's neutral. At its best, it's neutral. Your spouse cannot give you the hope that you need to be able to carry out and to live a fulfilled life. And I know your baby's fine, but trust me, they cannot give you the hope that you need to live fulfilled. Listen, your thoughts in many ways are going to be hopeless. Because we've talked about this in the past, most of us throughout every single day of our life live in negative thoughts that are repetitive and are on a cycle. You probably woke up this morning not wanting to come to church. You probably woke up this morning like, it's too cold to get out these sheets. Man, I ain't about to roll over and go up in that place. It takes too much energy and effort for me to get up and get myself dressed to go into God's house. And so doubt lives in those spaces where God's saying, you know what, why don't you just take a little bit more of an effort and recognize what I've done for you in your life, what I'm going to do for you in your life, and what has happened in your life. So when we talk about this concept of risky business, some of us as Christians have gotten so precise in the way that we do God that we lost our faith to see him do big things. Because you put him in a small box because you thought he was only good on Sundays. 
or you only went to pray for him for a couple of minutes in the morning, but you forgot about him throughout the entire 24-hour period. And God's saying, will you put yourself in a position to allow the Holy Spirit to become active in you throughout every process or moment of your life? Every possible moment of your life is an opportunity for God to incorporate hope. But again, you got to go to the right source to find out what hope is. Hope is not going to come from your money. I know it pays your bills, but it's not going to fulfill you. Oops. Somebody bring me a napkin. I'm drooling on myself. I lost my voice, guys. You know I'm excited. Your money's not going to provide you with the hope. That's why you can see somebody rich take their life because there's something missing. The money could sustain you for a periodic moment of time, but it will not fulfill you. Sometimes when you have your first experience with something that's amazing, you try to seek after it and get it again, but it never happens again because it lessens every single time you experience it. But with Jesus, it continues to expand. It continues to increase. It continues to grow. Like, I really realized that what I love to do is to have conversations about the importance of wholeness that's found in a relationship with Jesus. And the reality is, is that there's many ways, there's many ways to have this wholeness in Jesus. But a lot of us are missing it because we're going to the wrong things, the wrong things to find fulfillment. Listen, you can't fill your day up with all sorts of polluted content on the media and expect for Jesus to work through that. You've got to say, God, you're higher than this. I'm going to seek you out with intentionality. I'm going to prioritize you above this situation that I'm dealing with. I can't just go to you in moments where I'm on my knees and I'm struggling. I'm going to trust you in every area of my life and every moment of my life. And so the world is sitting here watching us, the people that we call ourselves believers, wondering what's different about them? Because I see them with the same attitude that I have. I see them chasing after the same things that I have. I see them struggling with the same things that I have. Show me what's different about being a believer. Like, when am I going to make the decision to say, you know what, I'm going after that because of the example that somebody else set up for me because they had a relationship with an object, with a person, with the Spirit of God. I'm going to go a little deep. Is that okay? Is that all right? Your experience is not your doctrine. Your experience is not your doctrine. I know that you've been hurt before. I know that you've been mistreated before. I know that you've been lied to before. I know that someone has intentionally abused you before. And you've used that as a crutch for the rest of your life to carry on the anger and the frustration that you have. And to be honest with you, you're justified in taking that anger with you wherever you go. But it's not going to free you to be able to live in your purpose and to pursue your calling. You've got to be able to seek out the one who is hope in order to provide you with the source and the strength to overcome the things that the world will do to you. You got to know that you live in a fallen world, like a fallen world. Remind yourself of that every morning you wake up before you get on your knees and go to him. This is a fallen world. I'm not going to put my hope in anything in this world. It's got to be above the world. I've got to understand the power and the sovereignty of Jesus so that I can see the good things that he's allowed me to experience in my life. So some of you have got to realize that your experience is not your doctrine. That's what happened to you, but what you have to realize is that you've got to trust him to be able to pull you through that experience so that you can still have fulfillment in every single day. Some of us are still holding on to resentment from things that happened in the past, and it's like weight all over your feet because you can't continue consistently move forward with a pace that's healthy for you to have fulfillment. And so I'm just trying to get you to understand where you need to go in order to seek out hope. But many of us are not willing to take the risk of trusting God. We'd much rather trust our bank account. 
We'd much rather trust, trust our retirement. We'd much rather trust the things that we can physically interact with because they're just so much more convenient. They're right there in front of us. But God promised us we need to access what's in the spiritual realm, which is invisible, so that it can come into your physical. And so sometimes we have to recognize the way that we live our lives, the way that we present ourselves to others, the attitude that we have, the words that we speak, are in many situations lacking hope. You've forgotten about the power of the Jesus that you serve. So this morning i got to take you to the Bible. Is that okay? i got to take you to the Bible. One of my boys, I love in the Bible, an amazing story, and I had to sit back and I had to, to really look at it. It comes from the book of Judges, chapter 6. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, Judges covers a period of about 300 years, and it explains what happened to the promised land between the conquests under Joshua and the monarchy that took place under Saul and Paul, or Saul and David, excuse me. And this is a specific moment within the book of Judges, and it's talking to people who have walked away from God in many ways. They started to do things on their own, and they didn't see the significance of putting him first in their life, and so hope had pretty much been sucked out of the entire area, that region of the world. It says this, The angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the oak that was in Oprah, which belonged to, Joseph, to Joash, the Abezerite. Now his son, somebody say Gideon. Gideon. Come on, say it like you mean to say Gideon. Gideon. Now I want you to kind of replace his name throughout this passage with yours. Was threshing wheat in the wind press to hide it from the Midianites. Now that's pretty much his job in this situation. So whatever you do every single day, I want you to think about that for just a second and think about the attitude that you have when you do that job. It goes on to say, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened? I'm sure you have said to yourself, God, if you're with me, why is my wife acting this way? God, if you're with me, why is my husband treating me like this? God, if you're with me, why did I experience that abuse in my life? God, if you're with me, why am I stuck in this situation right now? It goes on to say this. And were all his wonders that his ancestors told us about. They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? Somebody say Egypt. But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in strength. You have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look at my family. It's the weakest. It's the weakest. And he said, I'm the youngest in my father's family. But I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were just one man. Then he said to him, if I have found favor with you, give me a sign that you are speaking with me. Please do not leave this place until I return to you. And let me bring that gift and set it before you. We are living our lives without the hope that Jesus has set in you from the moment you made a decision to say, God, I want you to come into my life. And so we are going about our days showing a lack of hope in situations where we should be filled with the presence of God. Like I tell people, sometimes if you can't remind yourself, write down messages in your house and put them on the wall so you can be reminded of what the power of the word of God says. Because doubt is so heavy, it takes a whole lot of strength for us to be able to clothe ourselves with the armor that he requires for us to be able to penetrate the darkness that exists in the world. So what steps are you going to take to ensure that your family is covered and reminded about the power of hope that Jesus provides? Like what are you going to do to continue to seek after God, especially in the midst of a storm where it does not seem favorable that you're going to receive what he promised you? 
like what he promised you. And let's be honest, some of us as adults can throw temper tantrums when we don't get what we want right now. I confess I'm that guy. Throwing a tantrum when we don't get what we wanted. Doubting God when we don't see what we thought we were supposed to see. Lacking trust because we haven't seen the fulfillment that we thought we'd be able to walk in. I'm just trying to help somebody this morning to understand the significance of living a life that is full of hope. Somebody say hope. I'm going to go back here. I want to revisit something. This will probably offend somebody in here, but many of us are living our Christianity like the Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well. Let me explain that to you. If you knew the water that I provided, you wouldn't ask for another drink. But you see, we don't always recognize the power of the one we're in the presence of because we don't think we've seen miracles happen in our life. See, you look at your problems as a sign that maybe you're not called. But what I've realized, I had to train my mind to look at my problems as an indication that I'm getting ready to be promoted. And so what that means is, whenever a problem comes into my life, God, you're doing something special right now, and I know that the devil wants this not to happen, so put me in a position to reflect what it looks like to have you in the midst of the problem. Because the world standards would put me in a situation to have an attitude that would reflect, well, you know what, this ain't gonna work. I can't put no fight in. I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna let go. God, I don't trust you anymore because I don't see an example of you working yourself out in this situation. Don't you know that God made a promise to Abraham and it took him forever to come into fruition? And the same promise he made to him he has for you, but you don't want to wait enough for it to happen in your life. And you got to say, Lord, I'll wait for you because I believe you, because I trust you, because I have a hope that's not in this world, but the hope is in you. Like the hope is in you. Listen, Proverbs 23 says this, apply your heart to instruction and your ears to the words of knowledge. Like apply yourself, like remind yourself. You can't equip yourself with Netflix and expect to get a kingdom lifestyle. Come on, you can't watch so many drama TV shows and expect to see Jesus working in your life because you've flooded it with worldly things. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, and I love the King James Version sometimes. You just got to read the King James Version sometimes. For as he thinketh, somebody say thinketh. In his heart, so he is. How many of you thought about yourself in a negative way this morning? God didn't call me just to have children and give them the iPads and to give them TV. He called me to invest in them. He called me to direct them to kingdom living. He called me to direct them into a life of eternity. He didn't expect me just to walk around with them to give them things. He wanted me to invest in their hearts so that they could be equipped with what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And so sometimes we're just walking around haphazardly thinking that things are just happening circumstantially, but we don't have a connection to Jesus and the Holy Spirit's not working in us because we're so saturated with our problems. We're so saturated with our issues and all we see is the problem, but you got to look behind the problem to see how big God is over that problem. And sometimes we forget about that because the problem has just clouded our thought process. And that's a hit to your hope because you've forgotten who your hope is in. And if this problem stands before you, I gotta ask you if Jesus is with you, what can be against you? Like what can be against you if he said, I'm for you? So who are you trusting, the problem or him? Somebody say it's risky business. You gotta get off the shoreline and get out into the ocean. Some of us are playing it safe by staying on base every single day. God, I'm just going to stay here because I can see this. I can trust this. I can believe this. God's saying, get off of the base and go. Here's the deal. I love this concept. It's not that you would come to church, but that you would be sent into a world that has darkness all in it so that you could be the church no matter where you are. Like no matter where you are. 
Like this is a calling for me. I get the privilege of being able to serve in this way, but you know where I'm needed more? In the darkness. I can't just come in here and worship. I've got to go outside and show people who don't know them what it looks like to be able to know them. So when there's problems all around me, so when there's issues all around me, what's Andre's response going to be in that situation? How's he going to react to something that I know I'm going to be very upset about? Because this is going to determine whether or not I will believe in the Jesus that he says that he serves. And so you got to recognize if what we talk about in here on Sundays does not penetrate outside of these walls into the community, we have totally missed the mission that God has placed in our heart. Like we totally missed if all we think is coming in here and getting the worship songs that we want, the word that we needed, go into the world. Be sent into a dark world that needs you to be an example of what church looks like. What is the church? It's God's heavenly office orchestrating itself on earth, loving people, accepting them, chasing after their heart, receiving them, praying over them. Some of us have forgotten the power that God has given us instantly. Don't you realize the power that exists because of all of the sin he absorbed? I think there's like 8 billion people in the world. Somebody shout at me if I'm wrong, but somewhere around that. 8 billion sins he's able to absorb, plus the ones from all the years that have happened before this, and he took that to the cross to die. Do you know what type of power that is? And he says that the same power that raised them from the dead exists in you. Like that's wild to think that we would sit here and not acknowledge, Lord, you got power now in this situation. You can change my circumstances now if I just pray to you, if I just believe you, if I just trust you more. The same power exists in you. I wonder why he would say that. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? You possess the ability to allow things to pass you by, to break through, to experience growth, and to knock down walls. But you are lacking the hope that you need. God says without faith, it's impossible to do what? Without faith, it's impossible to do what? If you do not trust, and some of us have trust issues, We've been hurt. I get it. We've been disappointed. I understand. It doesn't feel good. I know. But will you trust me? Will you trust me? The most difficult time to trust something is when it's not working out. It ain't working out. It's it's not working out for us. I think we might want to make a decision. God's saying, will you stay on this path? Will you trust me a little bit longer? Will you stay here a little bit longer so I can work this out for you? But we are in such a rush to get to the next moment, we forget to exist and be present in the current moment. How many of us are sitting here today expecting next year to be better or next month to be better? Right now is an opportunity for you to embrace the purpose that God's put on your life. Like when you start to recognize that every single breath that I have is a gift from God and I'm going to use it fully. I'm going to use it fully. I'm going to forgive someone that hurt my feelings. I'm going to look past something that offended me. And I know about offense, it can sting. It can sting. But God said, I took that to the cross too, Dre, so you can let that go. You can let that go. And it feels so much better to walk in peace. How many of y'all can confess when you don't have that anger and frustration at that person or that object of your frustration anymore? You just feel so much more fulfilled. There's a health response to you not having that stress anymore about that individual that you were struggling with. But because you were so justified in being upset with them, you hold on to it. And as a result of that, you miss your window. Let me tell you something about grace. It's free. But here's the deal. God says, you know what, I'll forgive you. But favor is a different beast. Sometimes we think we're receiving favor. The reality is favored favorite it means preferential treatment but here's how you receive favor you've got to accept him into your life like you've got to stop doing what you were doing so that favor can come in and be yours because God says I will do great things through you but you've got to show me that you're for me 
And I need hope to be, in, to be a part of this process for you to receive this favor, to be able to knock walls down and to do great things. But I'll give you grace, but favor I'm going to hold until I see that you have more hope. Until I see that you have more faith. Until I see that you have more trust. And you trust beyond the things that you can see, but you trust me to work things out for your good. The Bible says that greater things are yet to be done. Like greater things, not just what you read about, but greater things are yet to be done. Like greater things are yet to be done. Right now, if you've got a moment, if you've got notes, you've got a pen, I'm going to ask you to write down three reasons Three reasons, and nobody looking around and like, what's right down on her paper? Mm, mm, that's a shame she wrote that down. <laughs> Pay attention to your own paper. I don't want nobody getting mad at nobody in here. Mm, I know she didn't write that down. What did he write down? Three reasons why you, personally, you, intimately, have struggled to trust God. I had to wrestle with this. The guy on the stage had to wrestle with these things when I wrote them down, because I didn't want to write it because I felt ashamed, but I had to write it in order to release it. Like, I want you to write down three reasons as to why you have struggled to trust God. You could do it now. You could do it tomorrow. But I just want you to write that down, three reasons as to why you have struggled to trust God. Because I think this is so important with you coming face to face as to why you don't have the faith. Because once you start to look at what you've written down and what the truth is about why you do not trust, now... We can go forward with addressing it and God equipping you with the tools for you to go past it and to begin to trust. Everybody wrote that down? Take some time. Take some time. Ushers, I need y'all to come in and collect those and bring it up to me. We need names on those too, folks. <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. I'm messing with you. Let me take you to Isaiah 55, 8, 11. It says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Somebody say that with me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways, somebody say my ways, are not your ways. This is the Lord's declaration. You can't do it, but he can. You can't do it, but he can. You can't do it, but he can. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, somebody say, my word, my word. so my word that comes from my mouth will not return empty. Somebody say empty. Some of us believe that it's returning empty. We want to be rich today, like right now, but we don't want to put the investment in for that to happen. I'll give you an example. You're not going to be rich today for investing in Apple. You had to do that 25 years ago. Sometimes when you look at something, you got to have vision to see what it's worth. You got to see the future right now. And God is giving you the ability to see something special because you have access to the Holy Spirit beyond what it looks like in the moment. My wife told me, baby, you ain't look all that hot when I first met you. I was like, what? Girl, I was all of that. Are you kidding me? She's like, but I saw something special sprouting up in you a long time ago. She said, my investment I knew was going to be the long haul. I saw a calling in your life. I saw something happening, sprouting up in you a long time ago, so I made the decision to invest in what God put in front of me. And some of us have passed up what he put in front of us because we don't see the value of it right now. And will you wait a little bit longer to allow it to sprout up? That's why I love working with young people, because you might not see the beauty in them right now, but greater things are yet to come. You got to understand, I don't care what they're dealing with right now, what they're going through, the power of your prayers resonates over time. The power of your prayers works over time. He just wants to know if you're going to continue hoping. He just wants to know if you're going to continue having faith. He just wants to know if you're going to continue having belief. Are you going to lose it 
and not have that belief because of the circumstances of the situation? Or are you going to have that belief to allow you to endure what you're going through right now? Somebody say risky business. Listen, I want to give you three things, and we're going to close. I want to give you three things to write down today that are going to allow you to trust God from this day forward. You got to stop thinking corporately. You got to start thinking kingdomly. That's not one of them. I just gave that to y'all for free. <laughs> Listen, business has a significance, but kingdom has a majesty to it. It has sovereignty to it. There is, there's foundation in kingdom. There's forever in that. And so many of us have to get away from what the world has taught us about how we think at systems and look at things and to see it in a kingdom way. That's why when you see your child do something that you don't like, you don't allow that to identify your child. You say, that wasn't right. You made a mistake, but that's not who you are. Because if I look at them through a kingdom lens, I know that they're called by God, and I won't allow their action to dictate who they are. The first one is this. We've been talking about it all day. It's hope. I need you to hope more. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 6, 9? It says this, 6, 19. We have this hope. Somebody say hope. As an anchor, somebody say anchor. When you put an anchor down from a ship, that ship cannot move. It does not move. It may waver a little bit with the waves, but it's not going anywhere. And if we don't put our anchor down, which is our hope, we're going to float right past the blessing. And it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast, which reaches inside behind the curtain. Isaiah 49 says this, those who wait won't be put to shame. Say it another way, where he adds, there will be no sorrow. You got to understand where he adds, there will be no sorrow over your life. If you're here today and you've made a decision to say, Lord, come into my life, where he adds, there will be no sorrow. And you've got to trust that and believe that. Point number two, and I'm going to ask our musicians to come on out is you need to trust God's promise. I'm going to read it to you because I thought this was wonderfully written. God's promise is his declaration of what he will do, and his oath is his announcement that he is ready to do it. God made a promise to Abraham I told you about in Genesis, but it took 20 years for it to transpire. Can I just be really here, y'all? I don't want to wait for 20 years. But listen, if that's what he ordained, I'm going to do it. Because I want my life to be blessed. Not only my life, but I want the lives of those around me to be blessed. I want to see each one of you walking in the favor of Jesus. Like I want to see each one of you being able to live a kingdom life. I don't want you to walk out of this place making a decision to trust in the things that you have consistently gone to which have done nothing but fail you. Like you got to make a decision to cut certain things off now so that you can continue to walk forward in purpose, in prosperity, in power. And my last one, I think probably the most important. You need to validate your status. Make a decision. Indecisiveness is going to bring about stress. Confusion is not what God called you to walk in. He wants you to have clarity. He wants you to have exactness. He wants you to be fulfilled. And right now, maybe some of the reasons as to why you're going through that storm a little longer than you need to is because you haven't showed him that you can wait in his waiting room longer. You need to speak openly to him what you desire. Lord, I've made a decision for you to be the head of my life, and I'm not going backwards. Like, this decision is final. And in finality, there's no more worry about a decision. It is set. And listen, we will go in front of presentations, 
all sorts of discussions that are trying to win our heart or to get us to invest in something that's not going to provide anywhere near the power of a relationship with Jesus. But we will waver week, month, year with whether or not we want to give our lives totally to him. And I've said it before, unless you make a full commitment, you cannot have access to all of God's power. And if you want access to all of his power, you got to give him all of your heart. And so what does that look like? I've got a hope. Yeah, I know it doesn't seem like it's going to work out, but I got to trust. I got to believe. Come on, would you bow your heads in this place this morning? Father, we believe in your sovereignty, Lord. Lord, in fact, Lord, look into my heart, Lord. Search it, Lord. Show me what it is that's preventing me from hoping even further in a bigger way, Lord. Lord, I pray that you search the heart of every person that is here underneath the sound of my voice that you would allow them to recognize what is preventing them from seeing you rightly. And today, Lord, right now, they would make a decision for you to be first in their life. For you to be first in their life. Lord, we're praying for a kingdom to come, Lord. Lord, we want to receive your grace and your favor, Lord. Lord, we desire nothing more than a relationship with you. In your name, we all said amen. Hey, can you guys stand to your feet? We do this every week, and every week I'm reminded of why it's so significant and why it's so important. You're going to get back to your busy lives in, in just a few moments but I don't want you to leave this place the same way that you entered. Like every Sunday shouldn't be a copycat of the Sunday before. It should be an opportunity for you to grow even more in your desire to serve him. And so I want to know if you're willing to say, God, I'm going to make a choice to experience breakthrough because I'm going to trust that you're going to break through in my life. And so, so many of us have lost the hope just because our circumstances and our situations have clouded us in our ability to see God do a miracle in our lives. But as I said before, the problems that you're dealing with are an opportunity for him to be able to work a miracle through. But are you going to him? Are you trusting him? Are you hoping for him to insert himself in your life? Listen, let's take this moment, just a few moments really quickly. If any of our prayer teams are here right now, they can come up to the front. You might need prayer. You might just need fellowship. Maybe you're just searching in your heart for certain things that you need clarity for. We're not going to play church. We're going to be church. Somebody say, be church. Like God didn't call us just to come down here and to check off the box. He called us to come and to live this. And so we have an opportunity right now to pray over you, to consult with you, to give you heavenly resources for your worldly problems. And I guarantee you, once you take on these heavenly resources, you won't fight these worldly problems the same way you did before today. So I'm urging you, I'm encouraging you to make a decision, make an investment in your future, which is investing and in giving him your heart. Come on, we're going to allow ourselves right now to go into worship. Let's give it up for the Lord.